In the mid-1970s, a young guitarist emerged in Texas whose ability and passion distinguished him from his contemporaries. Yet the blues world Stevie Ray Vaughan represented had little hold in the mainstream marketplace. And despite his obvious gifts, he struggled to secure a record deal. When his debut album, Texas Flood, was finally released in 1983, however, he not only became an international phenomenon, but also revitalized the blues genre itself. Texas Flood is one of the great debut albums. By the time he comes to record this, Stevie Ray Vaughan is 29 years old. There's a maturity there already. He's comfortable in his skin. It's fully formed, it's fully developed. He was pretty much the gold standard. That, that He was the guy. His guitar playing just jumps right off the record. It just grabs a hold of you and it's just undeniable. Almost as soon as he had been propelled into the spotlight, however, problems began to surface. After years on the road, Vaughan had developed serious addictions, and these would prove both detrimental to his recorded output and eventually life-threatening. People were starting to wonder about him. Friends were telling him that, you know, you gotta stop this, just slow down. The schedule was so hectic and so supported in that way because you just keep going because, you know, there's money to be made, right? The human element and suffering gets taken out. And so, you know, he's getting frail, you know, it's trying to keep up. Um, he knows there's issues he's trying to deal with and this isn't the way to be dealing with them. Towards the close of 1986, Vaughan collapsed and was admitted to rehab. He successfully responded to his treatment, however, and re-emerged a changed man, more powerful, more contented, and with a renewed creative focus. He gave the world one final masterpiece before his life was cut tragically short. Stevie came through that treatment so strong. He was a monster in his own way, like he was on the guitar, in recovery then. That's when his musical sphere started to expand. Him clean and solo was not only liberating for himself as a person, but as a musician, it really helped broaden his horizons. I might get a mug It's that gorgeous award, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. Dallas, Texas. It was here in the late 1960s that two brothers rose to prominence as virtuoso lead guitarists on the local music scene. Jimmy Vaughan and his younger brother Stevie developed their sound and made their name in separate top 40 cover acts, influenced both by the bands of the British Invasion and the musical genre that had inspired them, the blues. By the early 70s, they had made their way to Texas's musical mecca, Austin. Jimmy, a prominent player on the blues circuit with his band Storm and later the fabulous Thunderbirds, Stevie less celebrated as part of the rock outfit Blackbird. Yet as he progressed through a number of blues ensembles, including the Nightcrawlers, Paul Ray and the Cobras, and Triple Threat Review, the younger Vaughan brothers' reputation grew. After a decade of drifting in and out of these groups, in 1979, he eventually became the frontman of his own unit, Double Trouble, and now a confident lead vocalist and explosive guitarist, Stevie became recognized alongside his brother as one of the leading lights of Austin's thriving blues scene. I don't know, it's not so much that everybody thought that Triple Threat or Double Trouble or the Thunderbirds were gonna have much success. I think everybody just thought one way or another in whatever band, Stevie and Jimmy, they're gonna be okay. They're going to be good. It just so happens that Jimmy was in the T-Birds and the T-Birds had some success. And Stevie obviously had his success. And, and so we knew, we didn't know what form it was going to take, what band, what format, how it was going to unfold. But I think everybody just, it was just, it was just kind of, well, of course they're going to do good. But, but that, but. You, you didn't really feel that about kind of anybody else. Backed by the tight rhythm section of drummer Chris Layton and bassist Tommy Shannon, and now assuming his full name, by the turn of the decade, Stevie Ray Vaughan looked set for greater exposure. Unlike many of his contemporaries on the Austin circuit, including his older brother, his music and style continued to draw heavily from the blues rock of the late 60s, in particular Jimi Hendrix, and this gave it the potential for wider appeal. 
yet a record deal proved elusive. The band's historic performance at the Montreux Jazz Festival in July 1982 was a turning point, however, and although the attendant crowd were divided by Vaughan's flamboyant and hugely amplified take on Texas blues, the show would kickstart his career. It was a fairly purist crowd, and here comes this brash band that's a little louder and playing kind of rocked up. And even if it is Freddie King and he's quoting a guy from his hometown in Dallas, and he's playing it flawlessly, it just, maybe it's too loud. So at the end, you hear, it's a mixed reaction. It's like the crowd, there's some cheers, there's some boos, and the boos are audible because it's not, everybody's not going nuts. Yeah, thank you so very much. But Montro signifies the arrival of Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble and the revival of American blues music. Stevie was riffing off of Hendrix and the blues he grew up with, the jump blues, and Montro was the throwdown. Here we are. And it became very clear with the recordings that followed it that Stevie brought respect back to blues. In the audience at Montreux were significant music industry figures spellbound by Vaughan and Double Trouble's performance and keen to provide support. Blues musician John Paul Hammond passed tapes of the band to his father, the influential record producer and talent scout John Hammond, which led to the signing of a record deal with CBS the following year. David Bowie offered Vaughan a role on his forthcoming Let's Dance album, and upon its release, it introduced the guitarist's inimitable style to a global audience. And singer-songwriter Jackson Brown offered the band free time at his West Coast studio to record tracks for a debut album. When these were subsequently issued in June 1983 as the LP Texas Flood, Austin's best-kept secret became internationally renowned. One thing I think you have to consider is the context of the musical world in, into which Texas Flood is being launched. And the blues is nowhere on the map, to be quite honest. 1982-1983, we're into synthesised pop and drum machines, and the blues is old hat. Well, it's flooding down in Texas. All of the telephone lines are down. By the time Texas Flood comes out, Clapton is making easy listening records, Hendrix is long dead, Led Zeppelin have broken up. There is a generation of, of teenage budding guitarists out there looking for a new guitar hero. Step forward, Stevie Ray Vaughan. takes this Texas shuffle going way back, sort of pre-rock and roll, adds a bit of rock and roll, adds a bit of soul, gives it a contemporary twist. And what he does in the process of, 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 of that with Texas Flood is, he, I was gonna say he reinvents the blues, but that's not quite the word I'm looking for. He, he refreshes the blues. He makes the blues hip again. In the 80s marketplace, Vaughan represented a seemingly contradictory figure. Archaic and out of date, yet also explosive and refreshingly different. And he quickly struck a chord with audiences unconcerned with the latest trends in popular music. 
Following the release of Texas Flood, Vaughan and Double Trouble undertook their first stadium tour, supporting British classic rock heavyweights, the Moody Blues. And at the end of 1983, the guitarist appeared alongside his greatest influence, Albert King, for a Canadian TV broadcast. The new year saw the band reconvene in the studio to record their sophomore LP, with John Hammond himself taking on production duties and Jimmy Vaughan drafted in to add rhythm guitar parts. Barely five months later, capitalising on Vaughan's high profile, Couldn't Stand the Weather was released and confirmed that a major new talent had arrived. When the second album, Couldn't Stand the Weather, came out, we felt we'd accomplished a lot. But we still, for example, the album hadn't, first album hadn't been certified gold. So were there still hills to climb? Absolutely. Were there an audience there waiting for the second al uh, album? Uh, big audience. You know, we had grown tremendously, but it's always the sophomore album that catches the artist. So you really have to have a good one. Couldn't Stand the Weather was great. The song itself, just awesome. The whole album was put together in such a fresh, unique way that it, uh, it just uh, enhanced uh, everything we developed. Yeah, in listening to it the first time, there was no doubt in my mind. I didn't think we let any air out of the balloon. It was, it was still rising. By the second album, this isn't a Texas Blues album, this is a Stevie Ray Vaughan album. And you get a real good sense that, I mean, Clapton is a great parallel, that Eric Clapton knows how to play blues and you can make the argument he's a, he's a real blues man. But his recorded body of work, it's not all blues. And with this, Stevie became a rock star. He's in the modern marketplace and he is an entity and a brand and a sound. And pretty soon, I mean, by that second album, I will argue that you have kids starting to play in bands. They're sitting around saying, I'm playing Stevie Ray. And this is Stevie Ray style. The title track of Couldn't Stand the Weather reminds me very much of the Spencer Davis group. There's no organ on there, but there is a second guitar, which is played by Jimmy Vaughan. Um, and the second guitar sort of fills in where the organ ought to be and creates this sound bed for what Stevie is doing. And then it's got that kind of um, stuttering, syncopated rhythm. You can hear him, I think, trying to expand the sound. The second album is, is maybe more eclectic than the first. I mean, it is still steeped in, in, in the blues. I mean, one of my favourite tracks on the album is Tim Pan Alley, because he was a fantastic slow blues player. You know, when he slowed that tempo down, he just had such a, 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 a feel. <laughs> So the blues is still there, but he is looking to expand the, the sound. I think he avoids ever toppling over into that sort of bombastic 
style of, of blues rock. There's always a, a tastefulness. <laughs> I particularly like Scuttlebutt, which is an original kind of amalgamation of all the Stevie Ray Vaughan influences in a music that reflected not only his background, but the interplay that he had with his family. I love that. That was original. The covers are powerful, but for me are not as powerful. I really don't see the, the point of the Hendrix cover because it is so close to the original. On the first album, he covers Testify, and he gives it a real kind of Hendrix feel, which is very, very interesting because Testify was a song recorded by the Isley Brothers in 1964, I believe, and Hendrix was the session guitarist on that record. Most people, when they, they heard Stevie Ray Vaughan covering this Icy Brothers song, didn't really, they thought, that sounds like Jimi Hendrix. There's something rather neat there about uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan thinking, I'm going to pay a tribute to Jimi Hendrix, but I'm not going to do it by covering one of the obvious hits like Voodoo Child. I'm going to cover Testify by the Isley Brothers because Hendrix played on that before anybody knew who he was. There's, there's something really clever about that. And then on the, the next album, he actually covers Voodoo Child, and uh, I, I, I don't see the point of him doing that, to be honest. Yet the track did showcase Vaughan's technical virtuosity, and the album's success spread his appeal even further. Part of his allure as an artist went beyond a dynamic and singular musical style, however. Since his emergence on the international stage, he had also managed to establish a unique image. In contrast to the sober, downbeat appearance of most blues players, Stevie was flamboyant, playful, and totally distinctive. In the fashion and image-conscious 1980s, in which the arrival of MTV demanded that every commercial artist have a look, Vaughan's Tex-Mex guitar gunslinger stood out from the crowd. It was a look that he wanted to present, and he was always challenging himself on the boots and where the pants were folded, what kind of pants, a little blouse or a little bit tight, or jeans. He just always had a style. If he we had a breakfast meeting, he'd come out of the hotel room and down the elevator and into the uh, breakfast area at a hotel. He just looked unique and, and he looked like a star and it wasn't just about the hat. He knew how to, you know, present himself and it was just uh, kind of a cool thing, you know. Which boots do I wear? We all do this. He had a real flair and it was, uh, it was just fun. It's just the way he was. The hat, uh, that was him. He always wore it. Always. His mother, I was very close to his mother. I loved his mother. And she told me once, she said, you know, we went out shopping one day at the mall and all these people came rushing up to him for an autograph in his store and everything. And he said, you know, Mama, I'd just like to be left alone one day and, and people wouldn't get autographs. And she said, I looked at him, she said, well, if you'd stop wearing that stupid hat sometime, you wouldn't get it. Following the album's release, Vaughan and Double Trouble again hit the road, playing a staggering number of shows across the US, Canada, Europe and Australia. Amongst the many highlights of the tour was a landmark concert at New York's Carnegie Hall. Since taking over his affairs in 1980, Stevie's manager, Chesley Milliken, had actively avoided promoting his artist as a bluesman, concerned that this would limit his appeal. 
This one-night performance, however, was a true blues show, with Jimmy Vaughan, Dr. John and Stevie's blues siren of choice, Angela Straley, all invited to add to the historic occasion. He had had me out on a couple of tours previous to that, and it was such a, such a wonderful surprise to me. I mean, I knew he was a fan and, and all that, but as soon, it just seemed like the minute that he started touring outside of Texas or doing some significant things that he invited me along, you know. So that was a great honor. And of course, Carnegie Hall was the biggest of the great honors. Once again, Stevie tipping his hat at various people, Dr. John, his brother always, room full of blues horns, that, that the whole thing was a, was a beautiful concept. And then of course he was gonna wail anyway and do you know what he <laughs> had become famous for. When we stepped out onto that stage though, because at Carnegie Hall, the view is not from the audience. The, the view is of the hall, which is uh, so beautiful and all the, the vibes of, of the music that have, that's gone on there. We were all terrified and nervous, you know, <laughs> about the night. But of course, you know, once you start playing, you start playing. And I think half of Texas was there for the occasion, so that always helps. The Carnegie Hall show was, however, a high point before a notable downturn in both Stevie and his bandmates' personal and professional lives. With the relentless pressure of a life on the road that stretched back to the 1970s, the nights of heavy partying and the quick fixes to tackle exhaustion had developed over the years into serious alcohol and drug problems for certain members of the ensemble. As the band headed to Japan in January 1985 for a tour of the Far East, Vaughan in particular was beginning to sense a loss of control over his addictions, and many insiders became concerned by the situation, which over the next 18 months would spiral out of control. People closer to his management and closer to his family and so on knew that there was some things going on. And uh, uh, I knew there were things going on. And it was, it was starting to bother me, not from a music standpoint, but from a personal level that there were things going on with Stevie. And I knew uh, what it could do to a person people were starting to wonder about him and some friends were telling him that, you know, you gotta stop this, just slow down. You're on tour constantly and you just can't continue to do this. So yeah, it was starting to affect people's thoughts. Upon the band's return from Asia, however, their uncompromising work schedule continued unabated. In March, they were booked into the Dallas Sound Lab to begin work on a new album. Yet a combination of exhaustion and inebriation initially led to a lack of focus and little recorded material. In an effort to stir themselves from their inertia, the band decided to bring in new players to inject the proceedings with much needed energy. They invited saxophonist Joe Sublett, who had previously played with Stevie and Paul Ray and the Cobras back in the mid-70s, to join them at the studio. Sublett had just closed a tour with another Texas bluesman, Delbert McClinton, and the pianist in his band, Reese Winans, by chance also became a part of these sessions. Our sax player, a man named Joe Sublett, said, well, that, after that last show, I've got to go over and do this session, do this overdub with this band called Steve Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble. They want a saxophone solo. Of course, they had a great reputation back then as the band to see in, in Texas. There was all this excitement about them, you know. So Joe went over, uh, Joe was gonna go over to play. Chris Layton came to, the, to our show to pick him up and he said, hey, Reese, um, we'd, hired, we'd, we'd uh, had a piano player who was supposed to come over and play this song with Joe, but he's, he's not showing up. Can you come over and do it? I said, well, sure, sure, I'd be happy to. And uh, so Joe and I and Chris went, all, uh, went over to the studio and we played this song. It was a Hank Ballard tune called Look at Little Sister. They were doing this weird deal about they're going to play live in the studio. It was so loud in there. They had a PA set up, all the guitar amps were set up, just blasted in this room. I was sitting there playing the acoustic piano, couldn't hear a thing I played. 
Couldn't hear a single thing. Joe was sitting there, Joe, Joe was trying to play it. I, I don't know if he could hear much either. You know, when you're playing a sax, it's hard to keep in tune if you can't hear yourself. So they got a track, and then I think Joe and I both had to go back in and overdub our parts to it. That was it for, for Joe. They asked me, did I want to stick around and play another song with them? Uh, and I think we did a song called Soul to Soul, an instrumental. So I went over to the organ and started playing Soul to Soul with them. And they're really loving this. And uh, so we ended up playing another song after that. We did a song called Change It. And that worked out really great. And what I didn't know at the time was Stevie Ray and Tommy and Chris had already been in the studio for three or four days. And we're having a hard time really coming up with energetic tracks, you know, really keeper tracks. And so that night that I was there, we got three keeper tracks, which is a great night in the studio, you know, for anybody. And uh, so they asked me, do I want to come back the next night? I said, sure. So I came back the next night and did three more songs. And so we did two nights, we had half of a record done. Uh, that second night they asked me, did I want to join the band? With Winans now on board, Stevie also called in his ex-Nightcrawler's bandmate and former writing partner Doyle Bramhall to aid him with the LP's original compositions. Slowly, an album began to take shape, yet the sessions continued to be fueled by an excessive intake of drugs and alcohol. Did it affect the, how things went in the studio? Yes, it did. It affected it in that sometimes we wouldn't start recording until midnight. And then our schedule was we'd go in at midnight and record till eight in the morning and then come home when everybody else is going to work. You know, if we weren't partying, uh, they probably wouldn't do it that way, you know. Uh, but did it affect the quality of the music? No, I don't think so. I think the, I think the music would have been just that, that as good and as dynamic as it was, regardless of what uh, who was using what or doing what. Uh, uh, we were all, all four of us, all about the music, and we were gonna, not gonna have the music suffer at all, no matter what. In April, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble went back on the road, this time as a four-piece unit. And with a return to the Montreux Jazz Festival scheduled for June, new member Reese Winans had to quickly find his place within the live ensemble. I thought when I did join the band, finally we went to play a gig, I thought I would just be playing on the songs that we cut in the studio for Soul to Soul, because I'd never played any of the other songs. As we got to the first gig, and I said, well, what you, I guess you'll just call me out when we're going to do those songs, and I'll come out and play. Stevie says, no, no, you're playing the whole show. You know, you're going to play every song. I'd never played any of them. So the first show, we did 10,000 people for a show in Dallas. I played the whole show. Second show, we played in front of 75,000 people at Chicago Fest. I played the whole show. The third show was in Montreux in Europe. That's the, basically me when I'm starting out in the band. By the time we got to Montreux, I mean, we'd been, he'd been in the band a few months and the sound had already changed pretty significantly. Um, it was the whole the sound was rooted now in the idea of a, of a quartet, and especially being a keyboard as opposed to say, maybe a second guitar player or any other instrument. We knew that it was a chance to not redeem ourselves, but to redeem a situation almost. Like, we're gonna go back there, we're gonna do a great show, it's gonna be fun, people are gonna like it, we're gonna have a great time, and it'll kinda like, you know, some kind of closure to what was kinda like not a great experience. For the Montreux Jazz Festival, our reception was wildly enthusiastic. People would love it that we were there. I was so new in the band. I was just, I mean, I, uh, I hadn't been to Europe before. It's my, really my first trip there. And, uh, and uh, so I was just uh, blown away by everything. <laughs> Thank you. 
I thought the performance was stellar. And it was so good that we used it later on on our live recordings. We used some of the tracks and some of the songs from that original recording just because it felt so clean and so great that night. And everybody was really on their game. Stevie was really on his game, very excited. And the whole band was just playing well. Adding the keyboards was, was interesting and not wi a widely accepted thing. A lot of people didn't like the idea of the keyboards cluttering up the pristine blues trio that they had. And I totally understood that, you know, because I th also thought it was pristine and beautiful and it was different with keyboards added. Um, the band liked it when the, trio, when the keyboards were added. It gave Tommy and Chris something to focus on when Stevie's playing his solo, rather than leaving them so bare there. And, uh, and for Stevie, it allowed him to not work as hard on his rhythm, play a bit more, concentrate more on his singing, because the keyboard was there to support him. In September 1985, the first album to feature Reese Winans as the fourth member of Double Trouble was released, Soul to Soul. And although his contributions were favorably received, with less than half of the tracks on the record original compositions and with a marked shift in energy, the LP split fans and critics alike. The addition of Reese Winans on keyboards on the third album is an entirely logical move. You could hear on the second album where Stevie Ray Vaughan was looking to, to fill out the sound and he used the second guitar in places to do it, but, but actually the keyboards the, and the Hammond organ in particular do the job so much better. You can't it. Can't it. Time is all that we got. Baby, let's take it. On a track like Change It, it gives it this kind of pop soul feel, but it actually brings so much more than that. You can go through the album and, and you know, it's bringing something different to the table on almost uh, uh, every track. There's Gone Home, where Winans does this kind of Jimmy Smith riffing jazz thing, which is beautiful. Uh, and in other places, it gives it a, a, an R&B feel and it also sounds lovely on the slow blues as well just providing that bed for for stevie to do his thing over the top I think Soul to Soul was uh, on his way down. I feel that uh, the music wasn't there. I mean, Steve was a great musician, so he could play anyway. But the caliber of the music wasn't there. Uh, there was nothing exciting on the album. With Stevie, I could feel that he wasn't into it, but that wasn't Stevie. That there was something that wasn't right with him, and that really hurt him. I think it hurt his career because when people hear something like that from an artist that is always uh, up, th there was something wrong. It's easy to look back at the first three albums and say that he starts with a five-star album, follows it up with a four-star album, and by the time we get to the third album, we're talking about a, a, a three-star album. I think that's a little bit unfair 
First off, he makes these three records in very swift succession. So there's perhaps an inevitability about a lessening of the, the energy, if you like. Uh, also, with retrospect, we now know that he's about to burn and crash. And uh, possibly that impacts on the record. But at the same time, this is the most adventurous record of the three he's made with the introduction of the keyboards and uh, you know, things like the final track, Life Without You. He's doing something that he hadn't done on the first two albums. It's, it's got that kind of Curtis Mayfield feel. It's a beautiful, beautiful track. Somehow, though, it's a record that feels that the, the, the sum is less than its parts. They were getting tired. And I think the, the material, just the overall feel of that album is the, the, just the, the white heat fire of the first two albums was not there. The songs were not as strong, and it was more like this is where you start wondering, uh, have they hit cruise control now? Are they just going through the motions because it's time for another album? And what are they going to do next? It wasn't that exciting to me. However divisive the album proved to be, it sold strongly, once again reaching the top 40 of the Billboard chart and going platinum in the US. As popular as the band's output was with the public, 1986 also saw Jimmy Vaughan enjoying even greater commercial success with the fabulous Thunderbirds, who had emerged from years in the margins with their most mainstream work to date. On the back of the top 10 hit, Tough Enough, the group would play supporting slots and double bills with Stevie and his act throughout the year. And in March, both bands headed out for a tour of Australia and New Zealand. Yet during the tour, Stevie was not only struggling to get a handle on his drug and alcohol intake, but also with a relationship that had been in decline for years. He had married Lenora Bailey, whom he affectionately called Lenny, back in 1979. But her own substance abuse issues and his relentless tour schedule had seen them drift apart. In Wellington, New Zealand, Stevie met 16-year-old Jana Lapidus, and she would become the new love of his life. Despite the age gap, the guitarist was so taken by the teenager that he invited her to join him on the road for the month-long tour. I had just seen him on a music show that we had, and he was in town, and I'd watched his clip on there and liked his music. Um, wasn't, you know, didn't really know too much more about him, and realized once we met, oh, you're in town playing the shows, okay. Um, yeah, and then got to discover a whole new world. He was a sweet, sweet man, and we started talking, and we just hit it off. But you could tell there was some stuff going on that he was trying to work through, and I could also see that drugs and alcohol were still involved, so I was very cautious because, you know, even as a young person, you know, okay, um, that kind of goes along with a lifestyle, and that's not something I was into or was interested in partaking in, but I knew at any time I could head home. It was, it was safe, and it was good. It's like when you meet somebody and you, have, you feel something, and there's a connection, and you want to explore that connection, and you do, and you begin, and it's the beginning of a relationship, you know? And it's a beautiful thing. Jana would provide a lifeline for Stevie through the turmoil of the coming months. During the tour of Australia and New Zealand, his manager Chesley Millikin resigned, citing Vaughan's worsening dependency issues as a key factor in his decision. Having looked after the young guitarist's career since 1980, Millikin had been a vital figure in Double Trouble's ascent from the Austin blues circuit to the international stage. Suddenly cut loose from one of the driving forces behind the band, upon his return to the US, Stevie looked to booking agent Alex Hodges to find a replacement, only to realize that Hodges himself was in fact the perfect candidate. I had set up meetings for him to take with managers, and I would ask him about the meetings, and he said, nobody understands who I am. They don't understand what I'm doing. They want to find me the hit song. They want to mold me and manage me in a way that is, is inconsistent with what 
I am who I am, the music I'm presenting. And he said, I'm not through with my ideas, but I don't really want a manager to manage me in that way. There's a lot of guidance. And uh, so if you're willing to add your name to a list, then it's a list of one. When I took over management, the substance abuse issue surfaced. Did I have a hint? Did I have more than a hint? I did. It didn't interfere with our primary goal or our decisions, but it was harder to make decisions together. Um, I was concerned. Uh, in reality, I think Stevie was concerned, but I had a greater concern, and I knew uh, anything can happen. In this climate of uncertainty, plans were put into place for a live album to be produced as the follow-up to Soul to Soul and two gigs were recorded in July 1986 at the Austin Opera House, along with a further show in Dallas. Yet the performances weren't up to the band's usual standard, with Vaughan himself later admitting that he was out of control, and substantial work took place in the studio to ready the album for release. Issued in November, Live Alive met with a muted critical response, and although it sold well, many felt it was a disappointment. For Stevie's old Cobra's bandmate, Denny Freeman, who was in attendance at the Austin shows with saxophonist Joe Sublett, it was clear that the band had lost their way. I actually remember thinking, uh-oh, I think it was Joe and I that were together, and we were going, uh, I don't think this is right. We were going, does this sound, is it me, or is this, is this just a bunch of loud chaos? I remember thinking that, and I we said, no, I think it's loud chaos, and it doesn't sound good. I was very disappointed. I mean, just Jimmy was there and some other people, and uh, Jimmy wouldn't say much about it, but I know what was happening, and it was just the way Stevie was backstage, the way it was going on, it was just, I thought, an awful recording. I thought it was uh, very embarrassing for Stevie, for the people who was on it, and uh, uh, it just couldn't get any worse. That's when I knew that uh, the band was in real trouble and that things were going to happen bad. And uh, I was embarrassed uh, when the album came out and tried to sell it to people. In context of the live performances that I've heard Stevie Ray Vaughan do, uh, Live Alive ain't all that. It captured a band that was running ragged, really needed a break. This was a clear plateau. And in fact, if anything, you began to wonder, were those first two albums it? And we're just kind of, this is the long, slow drop off. It wasn't his best work. It wasn't his best live recording. It wasn't Double Trouble's best work. But there's the album and it's, it stands there as that document today. To me, it's more, that's the one where most of the red flags start going up. There's problems here. If you know the whole story, this is a real indicator that things are not going well. Another attendee of these shows was Timothy Duckworth, an LA-based songwriter who had been on the Austin scene during Vaughan's tenure in the Cobras. The two had remained friends over the years, and Stevie would often stay at Duckworth's home during Double Trouble's tours of the West Coast. Witnessing the guitarist's emotional and physical decline, due both to his failing marriage and his substance abuse issues, after the Opera House performances, he decided to step in and provide some much needed support. I went to Alex Hodges. I was extremely concerned about Stevie's health and his well-being and where he would go. We've seen this in the music industry so many times and we've lost too many fantastic and good people, musicians and people that work for the business and everything else due to drugs and uh, Stevie was having a really difficult time and he's and I know that's why he stayed with me a lot so I went to Alex's office and said Alex uh, I'm really concerned about Stevie and Alex was too he saw it and uh, I just sat and talked to him in his office and I said I think I can help keep him you know keep things as level as possible at this time and just we work through it slow you know I can't tell what's happened we work through it slow but there needs to be an anchor there. We were on the same wavelength we were discussing uh, Stevie's health um, and to just say you know 
will take somebody and take them off the road. Stevie wasn't ready to go into the hospital. He wasn't ready to go into rehab. He wasn't ready to do any of those things. And people have to hit some sense of a bottom of some issue before they're ready to take that. Or you do an intervention. And I'm somewhat familiar with interventions, but I, I just knew that wasn't going to work at this time. Best thing to do was have uh, somebody with the like mind of uh, really caring for Stevie in a unique way and being able to dedicate part of his life to, to keeping him safe. That was Tim. Yet the relentless schedule continued. With dates in the US across the summer, plus studio work on the Live Alive recordings, there was little time for focusing on the personal issues severely damaging Stevie's health. This was compounded on August the 27th, 1986, by the death of his father, Jimmy Lee Vaughan. With little time to deal with his grief, days later the band headed to Copenhagen to begin a lengthy European tour. Yet at the end of the month, after a show in Germany, Stevie was out with Chris Layton and Timothy Duckworth when the years of excess finally caught up with him. Three of us were walking down the street, just looking for a bar or something to go in, you know, and after the show, you know, how everything is just raised to a, a new level as far, uh, you're not really ready to just walk in and go straight to bed at that time. And Stevie started feeling bad and he started, he said, hold on, he started throwing up and he started throwing up blood. I knew that I had a problem, but I couldn't stop. And I knew that I couldn't stop. Every time that I had more pressure seemed to be a good excuse for more. And every time there was less pressure, it was party time. Those, that's the disease telling you that you don't have it, you know. Oh, sure, you can, come on, you can make it, you know. And uh, what happened was I ended up finally, I, kn I saw it coming too. I knew it was coming. Finally, I had a, every kind of breakdown at once that I think a person could have. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, and, and the whole ball of wax melted. <laughs> and I woke up on a bus. Well, I'd, actually, I'd, I'd had a nervous breakdown and had to go to the hospital first. Got out of there, and we were in a German hospital, and there were these people, I don't know if it was common in Germany or if it was just this particular hospital, they were butchers, you know, and uh, didn't care what you said when they asked you questions, you know, and thank God I had my bass player, Tommy Shannon, and a few other people I knew with me uh, to keep me from trying to jump up and run out, you know, because it didn't seem any safer there. That's why I went to the hospital. <laughs> then the next day, I woke up on a bus uh, crying, scared of everything, didn't know why. Didn't know what I was scared of, much less how to deal with it. Despite his condition, the tour nevertheless continued on to Zurich and then to London. Yet manager Alex Hodges was ensuring from his office in L.A. that the show would not simply go on, and that the guitarist would now receive the treatment he so badly needed. It was a moment you have to have to look at it in a way of good fortune. All we had to do was get him to the right people. I made a phone call, found the doctor who had worked with Eric Clapton, and got a personal rapport with him on the phone and introduced him to Stevie. Uh, and the doctor said, you stay in L.A. and you're, you're headquarters, you're the you know, you're the Pentagon and, and we're going to be on the playing field. We're going to be on the front line and it's going to be a lot up to Stevie, but this isn't two days in the hospital and back out. We've got some work to do. On September the 30th, 1986, Stevie Ray Vaughan checked into the London clinic of Dr. Victor Bloom and took his first steps along the road to recovery. They give you a, a form, answer these questions to see where you are. And every question Stevie answered, and he was completely honest at this time with himself, okay, 100%. Uh, before, you all, everyone that does drinks too much or does too many drugs, they always make excuses for their system. But at this point, Stevie was making none. And I do remember when he, when he filled that form out and basically every answer was, the answer saying that you're an addict, uh, it brought tears to his eyes. He was really upset and he was ready to get himself well. Dr. Bloom had a really stellar uh, background and uh, he was he was fantastic Stevie really liked him I really liked him we had several visits to his office and he made it quite clear to how serious the situation was there and it was 
it was life and death clear. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, you've got a problem. It was life and death. For his stay at the London Clinic, Vaughan requested that two people join him, his mother, Martha, and John Lapidus, who he had not seen since the Australian tour. Flying to London to see him was um, really important because I, you know, I had to know. I had to know, you know, what was happening. I picked her up at the airport, didn't, didn't know her, didn't even have any idea what she looked like. Walked off the plane, I just knew who she was right then. I don't know why. Just a, one of the most lovely people I've ever met. And uh, gosh, it meant so much to Stevie. It really did. His mother, Martha, um, was there. She had arrived. Timothy Duckworth was there. Um, Eric Clapton had been to see him recently to kind of add some support. The doctor that he was seeing was really helpful. He really um, felt confident in him. You know, I remember driving around in London after he came out of the hospital room, you know, we were able to go to a regular hotel and this was within the first couple of days of collapsing, you know, recovery. And having those, you know, withdrawals and him thinking, I need a drink, I need a drink, but knowing that, no, he didn't need a drink. This is his body going through this, you know. So I think for me, his mama, his friend, you know, to be there could just kind of, you know, guide him through. That must be an incredibly tough, tough time. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, he flew to the Peachford Clinic in Atlanta. Vaughan spent a further four weeks in recovery in Atlanta, while bandmate Tommy Shannon simultaneously entered a clinic in Austin. Despite the uphill struggle that this process represented for both musicians, by mid-November 1986, they checked out of rehab and began a new life of sobriety. When he would finally re-emerge into the public eye, Stevie Ray Vaughan was a changed man. The odds aren't very good, really. More often, people go through a program, they know they need it, they accept it, and then once they're kind of in good health, uh, you know, those lessons are forgotten and that discipline is left behind, and then all of a sudden they have to go back in. Stevie really uh, figured it out. Stevie came through that treatment so strong. I'm not saying he didn't use the 12-step program to help him, but he was a monster in his own way, like he was on the guitar in recovery then. And he was there to help others, and I don't think he really needed me or anyone else there for assistance anymore, because when he needed it, he knew how to go and get it. Go to a meeting or a 12-step program or whatever, and he just, I think Stevie flourished. Timothy Duckworth returned to Los Angeles, his job done. Yet for the life of sobriety that Stevie was now facing, he did need another companion by his side, someone whose presence had fueled his recovery. After being in recovery for a month where, you know, he was writing letters every day, you know, it wasn't so easy to make phone calls back then. And, you know, I received a letter every day, you know, and I'd do my best to write back every so often to get permission to get on the phone and that was lovely. And then he had a couple of gigs to play after he got out, so that was um, November, around November. Then he flew to New Zealand to see me as soon as he could after that. Then I flew to Dallas in January of 87 and got to see where he grew up. We stayed with his mama in his childhood house and it was beautiful. Astonishingly, by the end of 1986, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble resumed touring and the following year they continued to play shows at a steady rate. Yet the hectic schedule that had pushed the band to breaking point over the past decade was avoided, and with Stevie, Tommy and a handful of the road crew now sober, life on the road was a very different experience. Well, a lot of things changed, uh, uh, on the road particularly, because the party was over. You know, it, was, it, was, it wasn't the after the gig, before the gig party, uh, we got rid of the alcohol, and uh, everything else. Uh, and w once we got rid of that, then it, it was pretty, it, it, things got pretty quiet. You know, then it was just us getting ready to play a show. And there wasn't a big party after the show. It was pretty much us moving on to the next town. About that same time, we decided we were gonna have two buses. You know, we have a bus for the band and a bus for the crew. Previously, I think we'd all pretty much gone together. And uh, uh, this, way, this way, it could be more economical and more convenient to uh, the crew and to the band. For Stevie, there were also more fundamental issues to resolve. 
Having been drinking steadily for the entirety of his adult life, as he went back out on the road, he began to question whether he would even be able to perform without alcohol. He was concerned about would he have the fire in his plan that he had uh, before. And he, he just didn't know because he had never gone through rehab before. And, um, and it turned out to be a groundless worry. It was definitely a fear that he kind of had to face, you know, face the fear and do it anyway. And then he soon realized, okay, I'm even more powerful. And everyone around him, you know, that cared about him could see that, could acknowledge that for him. And he for himself, most importantly, it wasn't something he needed, you know, and that was the fear in the beginning. Wow, do I need this at all I've ever known? And therefore you can see the change in his music, the change in his persona. He looked better. His attitude, there wasn't so much anger. I think it was confronting at first that fear was there, but he faced it, he did it, and he sounded better than ever. So Vaughan was back, his abilities undiminished and his health returning. Yet his addiction and subsequent recovery would not simply be something he kept private. And in interviews and even on stage, he was keen to discuss both his collapse and the liberation he had discovered through sobriety. There was a lot of rough things going on, but um, hopefully I've grown past some of those things, you know, self-inflicted, self a lot of it. Um, nowadays I'm, I'm drug-free, alcohol-free. For a long time, no, I wasn't, about 25 years. And I'm just trying to work through some of those problems and, and grow from them, grow from those mistakes. In terms of Stevie, you know, on stage and, and his honesty about the program, uh, he didn't preach to people, but he would say things about staying at the party too long and suggest to people that they should be aware and take care of themselves. I'd like to talk to y'all for a second if I can. Because, you know, basically I got to start off thanking God that I'm alive and well enough to be with you today. And that all is as well as it is. You see, less than two years ago, I found myself in a real bad situation. I found myself down on the ground and I couldn't get up. And I mean, I was trying and I couldn't. He was not afraid to use that as a platform, but it was definitely at times, um, I remember early on, you know, like, am I gonna do this, you know? Am I gonna stop? And all these people, I know you're all having a great time partying, woo! -hoo! And some people are either gonna get it or just shut up and play. You see, I thought I could stay at the party forever. It don't work that way. Cause that shit will kill you. That stuff will kill you. What I'm asking you to do is to stay away from them drugs and things, because what they do is they eat you inside out, you know? They make you forget about those people that you really love, and they make you run from love, because you can't stand how good it looks. I'm asking you to take care of yourself so you can be there for your brothers and sisters when they need you. Are you with me? But the importance of what that meant to him outweighed that kind of awkwardness. Throughout 1987, Vaughan and Double Trouble continued to tour. Yet plans for work on a new record were put on hold until Stevie's divorce from his estranged wife, Lenny, became finalized. This eventually occurred in June 1988, and by October, the band finally went into the studio to record their follow-up to Soul to Soul. And where they had co-produced previous releases alongside Austin engineer Richard Mullen, this time, a new face was brought on board. Jim Gaines, a producer whose commercial sensibilities had been key to the sound of Santana and Huey Lewis and the News, among many others. Texas blues was not on my plate at that point in time. I was into making pop singles with Huey Lewis, G uh, Journey people, uh, Santana people. Uh, so I just looked at it as, wow, this is a challenge. I was the first outside Texas guy brought in. I think I may have been the first guy to say, no, that's not good enough. Because there were a few little moments, you know, we had like, dude, come on. We just played it. Well, that's okay, but we need to play it again. 
And I think that was my biggest challenge, is to get over that hurdle of being the first non-Texas person involved with this band, and then saying no. In contrast to Soul to Soul, where we get, would get three tracks in a night, uh, uh, on In Step, we would do a song like The House Is Rockin', and we would play it over and over and over and over, 25 times, the same friggin' song. The whole idea was to go in and cut that live. The solos are live. We overdub some of the rhythm parts. So w that is a very tough call. When you have to go in and you cut the tracks and the solo at the same time. Um, so once we got that going, you know, uh, I think and everybody figured out that Gaines might know a little bit of what the hell he's talking about, even though he keeps making us do it over and over again. Um, things settle down. Yet as well as having to integrate his methods into the group's normal working practices, Gaines also faced a number of unusual technical issues. When we first got there, there was a hum in this building. And it wasn't a AC hum as much. It's almost like a hum when you're standing under a big power line. It's like a magnetic hum. And I spent three days before the band got there and uh, was trying to figure out what to do and um, I built several cages and things, and I called a friend of mine in New York, and he said, man, you know, the only thing we know to do is wrap the room in copper. Well, that ain't gonna happen. I'm not gonna rebuild the studio. So I went and bought some chicken wire and some conduit and made a, like a batting cage where you back into it, right, and it's kind of open. And it knocked down this stuff like 70, 80%. Every day it was work for him getting his sound, and then once he got the sound for us to play through it over and over and over, and then there's something wrong with the amp, and then there's, we got to start over again. And it was just every day, says, good grief, this is the hardest thing I've ever done. And it was hard. And, uh, and the fact that he was fresh out of rehab, you, know, you would, might think, well, maybe that has something to do with why it was so hard, I don't know. I don't know why, if that had anything to do with it or not. I just think everybody was just really wanting this particular project to be over the top, to be really good. The album, In Step, was released in June 1989, and the hard work clearly paid off. With the reinvigorated singer and guitarist teaming with long-term songwriting collaborator Doyle Bramhall on several tracks that veered away from the blues, and aided by Jim Gaines' commercial production techniques, it was widely hailed as Vaughan and Double Trouble's most accessible and most artistically successful work to date. He's definitely out of his comfort zone and taking more risks. And yet it's still Stevie Ray's sound all the way through. But Texas Flood or Couldn't Stand the Weather, those are blues albums. By instep, it's music. It's not even a guitar album so much, it's music. It didn't have the bluesy feel that the other ones had. It still had Stevie's sound in there, but it had a pop feel that sort of brought the album up a little bit. And when I first put it on, I loved it. I loved the House is a Rock, and when I put it on, I went, this is absolutely incredible. And I started listening to songs. I loved every one of them. I thought the producing was great. This is the first time Jim Gaines had had something to do with uh, uh, getting the sounds and mixing the record. First time we'd cut in that studio. And uh, so that's going to change the sound up quite a bit. Plus, we're doing songs that are not traditional blues songs, you know, songs that have pop sensibilities. Uh, and, but we wanted to retain uh, uh, the energy and the excitement of, of the blues in those songs. Um, so it, was it a conscious effort? Um, Sort of, but we never really talked about it. We just said, well, how can we make these songs better?
I was looking for a contemporary sound because that's what I do for a living, or did for a living at that point in time. I mean, I, we had pop, pop singles on the charts. I, it's not like I was trying to make them a pop band. I was just trying to bring them to what I call radio-friendly level. I always think that. It's like, can I listen to this? Can I hear these cuts on the radio? Can I hear just one or two of the cuts on the radio? And one track in particular was destined for radio play and chart success. Crossfire had been written back in 1987 by Double Trouble without Stevie's involvement, instead featuring the contributions of Austin songwriters Bill Carter and Ruth Ellsworth. Upon the album's release, it became the highest charting single of their career. This was the first time we decided we're going to do a lot of pre-production. And, um, and so we rented a hall down in Austin, and we would go in and work on these songs and the germs of ideas for these songs and where they were going to go. And, uh, and uh, um, had a, a couple of friends of ours help us out, particularly Bill and Ruth Carter uh, would come in and play when Stevie wasn't there. We would sit around and we'd try to write several songs. And that was one of the songs. Tommy said, let's write a soul tune. So I've got this bass line. So he played this bass line and we worked on it, worked on it, and we finished the song. And Stevie didn't really like it much when he first heard it, but uh, he heard Bill singing. He said, oh, I'll give it a try. Day by day, night after night, blinded by the neon lights. Hurry, hell, who's selling now? No one's got the time to spare. Money's tight, nothing free. Won't somebody come and rescue me? I am stranded. Caught in the crossfire. Stranded. Caught in the crossfire. That was so gratifying to me and Chris and Tommy and Bill Carter, all the writers on that. It was unbelievable for us that we wrote that song. And, that, and Stevie gave it such a great performance. And here we had an actual hit single. Who would have ever thought Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble have a hit single? It felt like that was the absolute pinnacle. When we played that song live, people were waiting for it. I don't know how to explain the success of Crossfire. It's a great song, to be sure, and it has a message. And I don't know whether it was uh, just good timing with the rise of album-oriented rock radio, uh, or if it was an exceptional marketing and promotion effort uh, in combination with the fact that it was a good song, but something clicked on all cylinders for that song, and it became the most widely played uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan song of his career. Alongside the band's most commercially successful track to date were other songs in which Vaughan spoke openly of his battles with alcoholism and drug addiction. Although Crossfire seemingly referenced the events of the past three years, in Wall of Denial and Tightrope, Stevie and songwriting partner Doyle Bramhall, himself a recovering addict, directly addressed their demons. The reason Instep is seen as his best work is that it certainly contains his best songwriting. The guy has been to hell and back and he's got a story to tell. And he tells it with uh, great honesty and emotional honesty. There is that quality to the album that is saying, listen up, but without being preachy. Um, you know, I mean, if you listen to the songs like Tightrope and Wall of Denial, there's an emotional honesty to the songs that transcends preaching. He's not preaching. He's just saying this is where it can, can lead. So listen up, take heed if you want to, ignore me if you, if you will. And of course, you know, even the title of the album with its reference to 12-step program, 
Um, maybe not very rock and roll, but uh, he's actually done that and he's come out the other side. I was walking the tightrope, stepping on the bridge. Walking the tightrope, once a shame and a sin. Walking the tightrope, bring it all around. Walking the tightrope, from the mouth to the back. The honesty of Tightrope is remarkable. That was entirely courageous for him to do that. Because a lot of people that listen to blues and who write about blues romanticize drug addiction and alcoholism. We've lost a lot of blues musicians to alcoholism. That is not a good life. One has to look at someone like Lightning Hopkins, who barely recorded anything for the last 10 years of his life and dies of pancreatic cancer related to you know, excesses in his drinking. He was a terrible alcoholic. Jimi Hendrix, choking on his own vomit. There's nothing romantic about that. And so for Stevie Ray Vaughan to sing about that, those were the boldest songs. He's proud of his recovery, that he's going in a new direction. And those songs, for me, are the strongest. Yet it was the album's closing track, penned solely by Vaughan, that indicated the breadth of the guitarist's influences and abilities. An epic, plaintive and jazzy instrumental, Riviera Paradise was a startling departure. Stevie wrote that song way before we actually rec we recorded it then, but he never really played it. It was just something he noodled around with. Uh, um, when we cut it on, uh, for In Step, we had just finished playing some real loud rocking song, and I forget which one, but it's one of the real big rockers. And it was just like uh, a, a moment. Steve said, okay, well, I want to do Riviera Paradise now. Uh, let's dim the lights, and as soon as you're ready, let's go for it. It's a song you cut late at night. You don't cut it at 10 o'clock in the morning, you cut it at 2 o'clock in the morning. So at 2 o'clock, 1 or 2 o'clock, we're cutting it. And before they start cutting, I said, now, how long do you think this guy is, this guy? Said, oh, don't worry, it's like four or five minutes. So I've got X number of tape left at the end of the reel. I can see it on the counter. It's like, I think it's like six minutes or seven minutes I got left. I said, okay, well, I can do one take, and then if we need to do another, I'll change reels. Man. They're playing this thing. The lights is down. Stevie's down. He's, you know, and I'm, and it goes on, and on. And I'm thinking, my God, this is so good. And I look at my tape counter, thinking, we're going to run out of tape. So, I'm, I'm running. I'm literally running around the control room, trying to get somebody's attention. Stevie's not. He's got his back to me, looking down. Chris, Layton looks up at me, and I go, cut. Cut, the tape is running out, cut, 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 cut. So Chris looks at Stevie, Stevie looks at him, and, and he goes, Quack! gives him the cut sign, and I swear to you, they hit the last note, ah. I almost lost it. Riviera Paradise goes back to that, what he started with Lenny is, that's where I started thinking, man, where is he gonna take this? Where Live Alive was kind of a stall, Instep was like, we're back on the arc, and, and it's like, where is this gonna go? Mm -hmm. 
The success of the record raised Vaughan and Double Trouble's profile to an even higher level, and after appearing as a musical guest on David Letterman, Jay Leno and Arsenio Hall's primetime shows, the guitarist became a household name. In October, Stevie was invited to perform a set on Austin City Limits, which he had first appeared on back in 1983. For the second half of the show, he rounded up the other big names from the Austin blues scene, all of whom had performed together at the legendary nightclub Antones, to commemorate the 50th birthday of his sometime mentor and one-time bandmate, W.C. Clark. He had done one Austin City Limits. They wanted to do another because he had become even more popular. So they wanted him to do that, and he said, well, I'd be happy to do that, but I want my friends on the show. He said, we gotta go to Dallas to play a job. Austin's okay, you know, but the time's so doggone hard. I said, go ahead, baby. That's one place I don't join. But go ahead. I know you're nothing but a big town playboy. Us local blues people were pretty much ignored by the show. And of course it was loads of fun. It was, in a lot of ways, like an Anton's reunion. And once again, it was all Stevie who engineered that. After turning the spotlight on his fellow Austin Seensters, Vaughan and Double Trouble closed 1989 with a major co-headlining tour with Jeff Beck, playing to sold-out venues and huge crowds. And as the new decade arrived, more opportunities presented themselves that would introduce the guitarist to a wider audience. Perhaps the most significant being an invitation to appear on the television show MTV Unplugged, a series which had only just launched. MTV Unplugged was an absolutely brilliant idea because it was the antithesis of what MTV had been set up to do, uh, which was uh, to show these ridiculous pop art videos um, and it, uh, it had generated this, this insanity throughout the record industry where you'd end up with, with people spending more money on making the video to go with the record than they'd actually spent on making that record. Uh, and that didn't really suit a certain breed of artist for whom the music was paramount. Unplugged fulfills that need. It's the perfect vehicle for a musician like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Stevie wasn't familiar with Unplugged yet, but the show had caught my attention before the record label even had called me, and it was new. The concept of that natural, you know, live moment uh, and taking him out of the band uh, 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 environment and the stage environment and the recorded studio environment and putting him, I was just comfortable that he would enjoy it and that that would transmit through the, the TV. Brilliant idea. I thought it was fabulous and Stevie bought into it immediately and he called me back and he was just uh, excited about doing it. So went and did it. He had fun doing it. Any guitar player can tell you to try to play something of Stevie's on an electric guitar is one thing. To try to play it on an acoustic guitar is quite different. To try to play it on a 12-string acoustic guitar is a whole different animal. This was an amazing performance. Only three songs, but it was a, quite a treat. Well, you heard about love and you to the blind. My baby love and cause the sun to shine. It's just his voice and an acoustic guitar. So we hear these songs in an entirely 
new way, in a new light. It's almost like he's indulging his, his inner blind lemon Jefferson, you know, it's going right back to the, to the very roots of it. Uh, and although we know these songs in much fuller versions, they still sound complete. They don't sound as though there is something missing from them. Everything is there, just in the voice and the guitar. She my sweet little baby, I'm my little lover boy. And he also reminds you of the country roots of the blues. His picking in, in the MTV Unplugged session reminds me of Jerry Reed. Jerry Reed is the man who wrote Guitar Man, and then I think he plays on Elvis Presley's famous version of Guitar Man, and it's got that country blues feel to it as well. I think it was the sixth or seventh MTV Unplugged program in the series so so he's a you know one of the very very early ones and and he shows how it should be done 1990 looked set to be a momentous year for Vaughan in February in step received the Grammy Award for best contemporary blues record in May he and Jana began renting an apartment in New York their relationship flourishing and he and brother Jimmy had entered the studio to begin work on a long-planned collaborative album by August after completing a co-headlining tour with Joe Cocker Stevie finally had some time off, his next major scheduled appearance being two shows at the end of the month, supporting one of his greatest influences. Just before he played the shows with Eric Clapton in 90, we'd just come back from a holiday in New Zealand, where we met, Australia, where my parents were then living, and we'd stopped in Hawaii and had some downtime, because it was really important to him after, the, after recovery not to get on that same kind of craziness of a schedule where you're just being pushed pushed, his recovery had to be the most important thing. It had to be. Yet despite the success of his recovery, in late August 1990, Stevie Ray Vaughan's life would be cut tragically short. Only days after CBS held a party for the forthcoming release of the Vaughan Brothers' family-style album, Stevie and Double Trouble supported Eric Clapton at the remote Alpine Valley Music Theatre in Wisconsin for two nights, with Jimmy Vaughan, Robert Cray and Buddy Guy also appearing. On August the 26th, in front of a sold-out crowd of 35,000, the band who had revitalized the blues performed their final show. It was a great night. We, we had a great set. And, uh, uh, and everybody else was good, was really good. I mean, but I just thought that, that our, we were on fire, you know? We were just, it was just a, a magical night. And, um, uh, then Stevie got up there after that, at the end of the at the end of the night, to jam with everybody. And I said, "Look, there's Stevie, with Eric Clapton, and Buddy Guy, and uh, Jimmy Vaughn, and uh, Robert Cray." But I just thought Stevie was head and shoulders over all those guys. And uh, we were, I was I remember sitting out in the audience listening to him. I said, "Man, it'll never get better than this." Basically, that performance, the jam of Sweet Home Chicago concluded with everybody saying, man, that's Stevie Vaughan, he's just on, he's on another level. And he blew everybody off the stage. He won the cutting contest. And a reward for being a, a musician at that time was not having to drive in the fog back to Chicago, which was gonna take about two and a half hours with that kind of traffic. Uh, he got lucky, they said. He had a helicopter ride which would leave immediately after the show and take him and drop him off. And uh, everybody's going to see everybody back in Austin a few days later. And um, it was a foggy night. The helicopter took off, made a sharp bank, slammed into the side of uh, a hill, and Stevie Vaughan died. Back in New York, Jana was handling the move into their new apartment when she received her final phone call from Stevie. Because it was just a quick, quick weekend, you know, we thought, well, I, I thought I'll take care of this. And, um, and then even when we we're missing each other, it's like, well, it doesn't make sense to just jump on a plane for one night. You'll be back the next day or two, whatever. And then we're talking on the phone when that um, 
He said, oh, hang on a minute. Somebody had asked him if he wants to. There's a, another seat available on this other helicopter. You know, do you want to, I'll get, you want to take the seat? Somebody's got too many bags or they're too heavy. So I think it was one of Eric's people, um, a bodyguard or something with too many things. And um, he's like, well, it'll get me back earlier to the hotel room. You know, I'll jump on it, you know. When a seat became available, on the first run of the four helicopters, um, we were asked if Stevie wanted to go in early, and others of us, including me and my son, stayed behind for two helicopters to come pick up, you know, his brother and myself and a few of us who had stayed. Some had gone in earlier. And um, uh, when I got to the hotel later, uh, there'd been no crash, there'd been, I mean, there'd been no explosion and there'd been no fire. And it was just a matter of uh, the third helicopter had not come in. Nobody knew exactly. You could certainly fear the worst. Uh, in the world of aviation, I guess they call it pilot error. Stevie Ray Vaughan, dead at 35. When it was confirmed Vaughan was among the dead this morning, word spread like wildfire through the Dallas music community. Vaughan was on his way back to Chicago when the helicopter hit a man-made ski hill, apparently because of heavy fall conditions. The other victims were identified as the pilot and three members of Eric Clapton's entourage. Walworth County Sheriff's Police discovered the wreckage strewn across the Alpine Valley ski hill only a quarter mile from the grassy heliport where the helicopter had taken off at 12.30 a.m. For some reason I couldn't sleep that night and I remember just getting up and looking out the window and being like, why can't I sleep, you know, why can't I sleep? And it was odd, it was unusual. You know, finally by the time I fell asleep, if it must have happened, so the doorman actually had to come from the apartments because the phone had been left in the other, other apartment back in the day when you had phones and answering machines. And um, I'd waited for him to call back, and I thought, well, he must have. It was unusual. It was all very unusual. Maybe that's why, you know, couldn't sleep. And then uh, a few hours later, um, Martha was on the phone and Bruce, the sponsor, was on the phone, you know, and then... But Martha, our feeling at first was we didn't know all the details. It was maybe he... There's been a crash. We don't know 100% confirmed. You know, nobody had been out to the site yet and perhaps he's okay, maybe he's just hurt. I was in my hotel room getting ready to go home because uh, that was the end of our, our, our trip. Road manager called and uh, said we had to have a meeting. And I said, really, right now? It's like seven, six o'clock in the morning or something. And uh, I said, okay, well, I hope this is important. Uh, getting me out of bed and, uh, and, and um, yeah, it was important. And uh, so that's where I was. And uh, we spent there, uh, the, well, what happened was there were misleading reports about the helicopter accident to where uh, some of some people had been reporting that Stevie Ray and Double Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble had gotten killed, you know, and and so I had to call my family and tell them that I wasn't dead, uh, and uh, so that's what that day was like. And finally, the everybody, you know, the truth became out that it wasn't us, but uh, uh, it was Stevie, and um, and. Um, and it was just uh, the saddest of all days. Stevie's body was flown to Love Field Airport in Dallas, and on August the 30th, over a thousand people attended the funeral of a master musician who had been tragically taken while at the height of his powers. The thing I remember most is uh, taking Stevie's body off the plane. The thing I remember most is that it was a, uh, just a wooden box. It wasn't a casket. And uh, right then it kind of hit me that it was true. And uh, he, always, uh, he always wanted to get back to Texas, he said, when he was on tour. And I, I just remember we, were, we brought him back to Texas for the last time. 
That was one of the saddest feelings in my life. The service was remarkably beautiful, and I think everybody, uh, you know, just recognized that they had to pick up their lives. Um, but the, uh, the sadness really never goes away. Here's a guy that should have been dead a long time ago and somehow managed to pick himself up with the help of a lot of people and get himself straight and righted and not only catch himself, but move forward, get his life back together, move on. He, he, had, he had a wonderful fiance that he'd met in New Zealand and they were madly in love and they were talking about marriage and, and kids. And he was back in Dallas, still coming into Austin, but his life was together. For the first time in his life, he was able to actually enjoy the spoils of his success, the material spoils, and, and live it well and enjoy it. And he was having a good time. And his plane was better than ever. And for all that to happen and to peak on this last night, and then the end, is so frustrating for anyone that's, uh, that followed him or kept up with him, because, I mean, what a great life. But in, deep down inside, I can't help but think, well, what if? He had a very distinctive sound. Uh, he left a great legacy, but I just can't help but think, what if, what could have been, because he checked out way too early. And life is life, and death is death. Uh, but I sure wish he would have hung around for, for a lot longer. For Double Trouble themselves, the loss of such a unique talent impacted both their personal and professional lives. With Stevie as the focal point and driving force behind the group, in losing both their band leader and their friend, they were cast adrift. It's strange, you know, we'd done so much together. Honestly, you know, for a while I felt like, wait a minute, I was supposed to have been on there too. I was supposed to have been on there too. What happened? You know, wasn't I supposed to go too? You know, I, it's, I had such confusing, confusing feelings, you know, that it was, there's, I mean, there's really no way I can put it into words. It's just like, it totally ripped my life apart. You know, it was just a very tragic event, and, and what it meant to us was that our, our friend was no longer with us, and, uh, and we would miss him terribly, and, and also that we didn't have a job anymore, and uh, we'd miss that, we'd miss playing with this band, and all the things that we had been working on for all these years was over. And uh, so it was a big ending, you know, uh, uh, and, and it was, it was, you know, it's, 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 I mean, I hate to put it in, in those kind of terms because it's really a human tragedy, you know, that uh, all those people got killed unnecessarily, you know, and the fact that it affected my job and my life uh, is sort of, you know, superficial, you know, that's, that doesn't, to me, it doesn't seem as important as the human tragedy of those guys who got, who, who got lost. And... Um, but, it, but my life did, the truth of it is, my life did change quite a bit. Um, uh, the, like I said, the band was, was over. Um, and not only that, but I kind of didn't feel like playing music anymore. You know, I just didn't, uh, it just, just didn't feel right anymore. In September 1990, the Vaughan Brothers Family Style album was issued. Featuring no members of either Jimmy's Fabulous Thunderbirds or Double Trouble, it presented a fresh sound overseen by producer Niall Rogers and captured the only sustained collaboration between the brothers in the studio. Upon its release, it reached the top 10 of the Billboard charts and eventually went platinum in both the US and Canada. I think it was terribly important. It really was. In talking to Jimmy, uh, it was a thing that they'd always wanted to do. And... Uh, they finally got to sit down in his studio over here and uh, play the music they wanted to play. 
they enjoyed every day going in the studio. They just sort of hung there and they did it. They enjoyed it. You could tell by the sound that they had fun doing it. That's, it it's a fun album. You can listen to it and all, it, everything's fun. There. Say thanks to me like a cowgirl would. I do tricks for you like a cowboy should. You look romantic laying in the hay. I need you tonight in a new kind of way. The Bond Brothers album was a huge success, and, and you know how much of that is posthumous sales. Uh, you're one of the two principals died tragically. That certainly helped sell the album. There was a lot of blues foundation and blues all through it. But Good Texan, I can't call that a blues, and it's kind of a goofy, almost a novelty song like Long Tall Texan. It's just a great song, and that loping beat, that's, you know, that's riding on a horse in Texas. And there's goofy stuff like DFW, I mean, which is, there's, there, it's, it's all over the map. Nile Rodgers brought a lot of goofiness or outside ideas to the session, I think. The main thing is, is it brought Jimmy and Stevie together in a way that no recording ever had. And there'd always been this sense, you know, it was a rivalry. Only Jimmy and only Stevie could tell us the nature of the relationship. But, you know, they played with each other some. There was a lot of sense of competition and, you know, how Double Trouble blew past the Thunderbirds had become huge, far bigger than the Thunderbirds ever were. And, you know, maybe that didn't sit well with Jimmy or not. But family style was a whole reconciliation. And on, on many levels, not just even musically, but that's where Stevie started talking to Jimmy about getting sober. And the younger brother got the older brother to turn his life around, too. The sick and the hungry and smiles on their faces The tired and the homeless and family all around the streets and the cities were all beautiful places The walls came tumbling down People of the world one of the songs on Family Style was TikTok, written by Nile Rogers and Jerry Lynn Williams. And of course at the time, Stevie and Jimmy didn't know how prophetic the lyrics of that song were going to be. Time was slipping away. Um, and so it became a bit of an anthem. At the funeral, it's the song that they chose to play for the public. And Nile Rogers introduced it, and I don't think there was a dry eye in the place. TikTok is atypical of Stevie's catalog. Still a great R&B song, very good, well performed, well recorded, you know, it's great. Um, but it was obviously helped into single status by the fact that Stevie passed away. I guess in a way, it's a shame that this is Stevie's last studio album. Um, not because it's a bad album, uh, but it is a lightweight album. I don't think there's any question about that. Jimmy's No Great Shakes as a singer. A couple of the instrumentals on the album are fairly routine. On the other hand, it would have been very sad if they'd never got to make an album together. So I think it's one of those records that uh, you're glad that it exists, but uh, it's not going to be the first record you put on the turntable when you want to listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan. In the wake of the album's release, interest in Stevie's life and work continued to build, with the music press busy digging up lost interviews and publishing in-depth tributes to a musician who was becoming even more appreciated now that he had gone. 
To satiate a global audience clamoring for any unreleased material, Jimmy Vaughan himself oversaw a lengthy inspection of the archives and compiled the posthumous LP, The Sky Is Crying. Issued in November 1991, it collected songs from across the recording career of Stevie and Double Trouble. I think Jimmy did a great job under extreme pressure and emotion to pick the best of what was left in the can. Um, they're good songs. Uh, in some cases, they're songs that we probably would have heard on a Stevie record anyway. You know, Boot Hill had been considered for release on at least two previous albums. It was a really strong recording. It didn't really fit with the theme of In Step. I think it was about as fitting as a posthumous album could be. I mean, it's, yes, there's room for more releases and probably more stuff in the vaults that been, you know, would be pulled out after the fact, but this was a pretty good, it was closure. And, and, and for something that was very hard to have closure with. And it, that's, it's more, not that someone dies, but at the time of their life and how many years they lived and, you just knew that there was, there was more fuel in the tank. This guy had more to say, but this is the body of work. And so I, I really like, in fact, the title track just says it all to me. The sky's crying. Just what a sad thing for this guy to go when he went. The sky is crying. There's some pretty fine stuff on Sky Is Crying. Uh, the title track is great. Um, I like the version of Little Wing. Those are two songs that Eric Clapton had covered in the 1970s and give me Stevie Ray Vaughan's versions of both of them every time. I mean, his version of Sky, The Sky Is Crying, which is a, an old Elmore James song, is, is superb. But if there is a hidden gem, it's Life by the Drop, which Stevie didn't actually write. It's a Doyle Brammel song, but it's just his voice and his guitar. Hello there, my old friend. Not so long ago, it was still the How it's happened, living life by the drop. If you want a requiem for him, it's probably that track. And it reminds me of Jimi Hendrix's acoustic guitar version of Hear My Train Are Coming, or even Bob Marley's Redemption song. So that's, that's the gem on that album. That's the requiem for Stevie Ray Vaughan. That's the track that says, remember me this way. And in the years that have passed since his death, Stevie Ray Vaughan has been remembered. In Austin, the city in which he made his name, he has remained an honored musical icon, the figure who burst out of a local scene and brought Texas blues to a worldwide audience. And his work has continued to find new generations of listeners, in part because since his passing, no other bluesman has managed to emerge from the margins of popular music and cross over to such a large mainstream audience. It's interesting to think about the absence of Stevie Ray Vaughan in music. 
Somebody called me up and said, my son's the next Stevie Ray Vaughan. I, I probably would, I mean, how interested could you be in that? There's only one. You know, there'll always only be one. And Stevie did for music and blues and blues rock something unique. And I think, A, his music would have continued to be creative. I don't think that there would have been a loss in his sense of creativity and looking for something new to say musically ever. So we lost all of that. And he would have produced new sounds, new ideas, new songs. There would be so much uh, more that Stevie Ray Vaughan would have given us. In terms of what he gave to blues and blues rock, I think he interpreted it so much differently at a moment when it was, uh, you know, swimming upstream. It was a buck in the tide. Stevie just did it because he was had his own ideas and he was committed to his music. And if he'd end up just playing clubs all the rest of his life, rather than sacrificing who he was musically, he probably would have chosen playing clubs the rest of his life. It seemed to me as though there was a huge hole in music. You know, uh, I felt that we were not only at the top of our game uh, as a band, but that we were dragging a lot of other people with us, you know, or, or not dragging with us, but helping them to get attention. And, uh, and a lot of the, the blues guys, you know, without us up there, it seemed like they were less important too. And it seemed, it seemed like, to me, my impression was, is there was a kind of a hole in the music. You know, if you say, what is the legacy of Stevie? You know, I would say that he was pretty much the gold standard, that, that he was the guy. There's a lot of great blues guys that are still playing today. Whether any of them will be able to reach that pinnacle of headlining festivals and, and bringing all of the other blues artists to light along with them, I don't see that uh, blues has that power these days. I hope somebody else could come along and be that kind of dynamic of a player. And uh, uh, there's a lot of wonderful players right out, out there right now. And maybe, uh, you know, some, some of them will catch everyone's interest. And I sure hope so.